گڈ مارننگ لیڈیز جینٹمین اٹ از ٹین ٹوینٹی سیون اینڈ اٹ واز اناؤنس وین وی بیگین دیٹ وی شوڈ کلوز دس سیشن بائی ٹین تھرٹی بیکاز دیر از اے ویری امپارٹنٹ سیشن آفٹر دس سو آئی ایم ٹیمپٹیڈ ٹو ڈو مائی بیٹ ان اے منٹ اینڈ اے ہاف اینڈ لیو دی ریمیننگ ون اینڈ اے ہاف منٹس فار انٹریکشن بٹ آئی تھنک آئی ول انڈلج اینڈ وائلیٹ دی ڈسپلن آف دی سیشن ود پرمیشن آف دا ہاؤس دی سیشن از آن واٹ شوڈ بی دی گروتھ ماڈل فار اس ان دی لائٹ آف رائزنگ ایکسپریشنس لیٹ می بگن ود وی اینڈیڈ یسٹر ڈے سدارتھ آسٹ اے کوشچن از دی پبلک سیکٹر نیسیسری اینڈ ہیری آئی بلیو آنسر دا کوشچن بائی سینگ اٹ از اینڈ سنس دیر واز نو فار دا ڈسکشن آف دس بیکاز پیپل وار ویری کین ٹو گیٹ آؤٹ اینڈ انڈلج ان ٹو سم اسپریچول سیشنس سو آئی بلیو دی میٹر از سیٹلڈ پبلک سیکٹر از نیسیسری مسٹر منیش تیواری ہیز آلسو ایکسپلین ٹو اس ان سم ڈیٹیل وائی وی ہیو فالو دی اکنامک ٹریجیکٹری دیٹ وی ہیو انیشلی اے اسٹیٹسٹ ماڈل ایز ای سیڈ اینڈ سبسیکوینٹلی اے لبرلائز ماڈل آئی تھنک دیر از نو ڈیبیٹ وی نیڈ ٹو ہیو اے مکسڈ ماڈل But the question arises, what should that mix be? How is it to be decided how much of state and how much of private enterprise? This debate is, you know, couched in several ways, shapes and forms, but let's sort of, in the interest of time. Uh, I believe a classic example of this trickiness of the interaction between the state and uh, if I may say business or India Inc. is uh, the well-known uh, or ill-known person called Vijay Malia. He disappeared, so people say, with a lot of money uh, owing to public sector banks, about 8,000, 9,000 crores. And he is the villain of the peace. Sure, he is the villain of the peace, but he was also a member of parliament. So that tells us about our democracy, if I may make a passing remark. But my issue with that episode has been, why did these banks lend to Vijay Malia? Were the managements of these banks incompetent or were they corrupt? If they were incompetent or corrupt, how did they get there in the first place? Who appointed them? And if they were not incompetent, if they were not corrupt, then why did they make these decisions? I believe if the senior managements of the banks who did this lending, which somebody referred to as reckless lending, were to be questioned, and questioned at the risk and pain of coercion, not physical, but all kinds, I believe they will tell us who told them to do so and why they did so. But that has not been done. Statements have been made. Uh, now, this is what I didn't want to do. Statements have been made uh, that we don't want to go into that. And I wrote a piece some time ago at that time saying there is a conspiracy of silence. We don't go beyond a point at finding out why this happened. And that is what I think leads us to this complex relationship between business and politics. Uh, if we are to decide in the national interest what should the mix of public-private be in a mixed model, then we need to set these two variables in this equation, business and politics. I'm sorry, I may be a little blunt, but at the age and stage in my life, this is how I am. Uh, in the, let me take the business thing first. <clears throat> Uh, uh, somebody who is well known, but I not name him, uh, said the following. The crooked politician needs to needs the businessman to provide the funds that allow him to supply patronage to the poor and fight elections. The corrupt businessman needs the crooked politician to get public resources and contracts cheaply. And the politician needs the votes of the poor and the underprivileged to get elected. 
I don't want to name him because the guy lost his job for saying so, and or maybe did not get an extension for saying so. I don't have a job to lose, so I can quote him. Uh, <coughs> looking at the business first, uh, way back uh, in 1937, I believe, onwards, Mahatma Gandhi started talking about what he called the concept of trusteeship. The essence of which was that any person who has wealth, the wealth belongs to society, and this is held by, in trust by that person. And let me quote Gandhi again, not again, let me quote Gandhi. Supposing I have come by a fair amount of wealth, either by way of legacy or by means of trade and industry, I must know that all that wealth does not belong to me. What belongs to me is the right to an honorable livelihood, no better than enjoyed by the millions of others. The rest of my wealth belongs to the community and must be used for the welfare of the community. Now this was 37 to much later. He kept doing this for a long time. Uh, the socialists did not like it because they thought it was in favor of the so-called capitalists and the capitalists did not like it because they thought it would lose their control over their wealth. Now, subsequently, much later, now we have a law about corporate social responsibility. 2% of the profits and so on have to be spent on corporate social responsibility. This, incidentally, is also not new. In 1966, uh, uh, Lal Badu Shastri was the Prime Minister, and Jay Prakash Narayan organized a seminar in Delhi on what he called social responsibilities of business. And the proceedings of that seminar are available in the form of a publication. But Jayaprakash Narayan's description of social responsibility was, business is not an end in itself, it is only a means. The end is man himself. Business must contribute to man's happiness. This freedom, his freedom, his material, mental, moral, and spiritual growth. Now, this is what we've had, but we obviously find newer things more attractive, so we, we will follow the law, pay 2% to CSR activities and so on. Uh, but the question then arises, uh, business tends to, uh, I have studied organizations all my life for 40 years, uh, and there is a field of study called organization theory which says that businesses perform in a variety of settings and they, they are influenced by a lot of factors and one of them is what is called organizational environments. The most influential component of organizational environments in India is obviously the state. Yesterday also there was a debate about the state and the private sector and I think Harry Dahl said, the state wants you, you want us to come in. I was wondering who's you and who's us. Uh, the business also needs to realize that the state is all of us. None of us can be beyond the state. But the question is, which is more important is, how does the state come to be personified and operationalized? That happens through the electoral process. We elect members of parliament, members of state assemblies, and in those assemblies, there's supposed to be a democratic process, and I deliberately say supposed to be, to elect the leader of those houses, and they become our leaders. They become, they, they come to personify the state. Now, political parties play a very critical role in this business. Political parties put up candidates for election, out of which we choose. So a voter's choice while voting is pre-constrained by choices made by a set of political parties. We get a slate of 10 candidates. We could theoretically can vote for either of the 10, but we also know that out of those 10, either two or three or at the most four have a chance of winning. So if we don't vote for any of the winning candidates, we tend to think that vote to waste, what will be the benefit of voting? And when we look at those three or four 
possibly winning candidates, uh, the, the organization that I am involved with these days, we do analysis of uh, affidavits that candidates submit with the nomination papers. We also do what is called a red alert constituency analysis. A red alert constituency is where three or more candidates have criminal cases pending against them. Now, uh, there's data available to show that mo about half or more than half constituencies are listed as red alert. So what choice do voters have? Either vote for a candidate whom they know will not get elected or vote for one such candidate. This also <clears throat> kind of comes to mind when we are told that people elect such people and they are winnable people. So there are mechanisms within the electoral political systems through which we get what I think are suboptimal outcomes. It's easy to criticize, and I am often accused of doing that, but let me suggest two things. One is business tends to set, uh, needs to set it, its house in order. Uh, I didn't want to say this, but it has come up. I was part of a committee set up by an industry association uh, to look at electoral reforms. Uh, a former chief election commissioner was also on that committee, and there were several people from the industry. We had several meetings, and this chief election the former chief election commissioner and me kept saying that you must, we must say in this report that this association will issue a directive or a suggestion to its members not to pay to political parties in cash. On that issue, there was no agreement, and now it is about a year and a half ago that there has been no meeting. The, the committee, I suppose, stands disbanded or whatever. The problem is this complicated relationship between business and politics. Political parties have to be transparent, as far as their financial matters go, yes, they submit income tax return, yes, they submit donate, copy, list of donations over 20,000 rupees to the election commission, but data shows from income tax returns and uh, statements of donations that most parties have about 75 to 80% of their income is from unexplained sources. And there's one political party which says that although their income is 500 crores a year, they say they get zero donations more than 20,000 rupees. So two things. Business need to understand that each of us organizations working alone, we take care of our environment in a variety of ways. You know that better than I do. But business, if it has to have a say as an important constituent of society, which it is, it has to get together. When I got this topic, uh, what should be the growth model in, the, in view of rising aspirations, I wondered, aspirations of whom? Of the independent power producers? Of the power sector? Of the industry as a whole? Or of the society as a whole? Aspirations are rising everywhere. We need to figure out which one do we want to focus on. So if business wants to play its rightful role in society, which it should, as a matter of fact, it takes me back to 1944, uh, a few months before I was born, a group of eight leading business persons produced what came to be called the Bombay Plan. And it was headed by uh, J.R.D. Tata and G.D. Birla and Purushottam Das, Tikam Das and so on and so forth. Eight people. Incidentally, they proposed it as a 15-year plan, economic plan for the country. Again, it was not liked neither by the socialists nor by the capitalists, but a very little known fact is that the first three five-year plans of the government of India looked very similar to the Bombay plan. So eight leading industrialists in 1944 suggested that state should lead the economy. Yes, times have changed, and therefore the economic philosophy is also changing. The mix is getting adjusted, as Manish Tiwari said. So we need to do that, 
uh, A, business getting together, B, financial transparency in political parties, and C, which is of course a very, very difficult thing to even suggest, uh, is internal democracy in political parties. When we talk to political parties, they say we have internal democracy. But internal democracy needs to be demonstrable and real. Then the question arises, demonstrable to whom? Idiots like Jagdeep Chokar, no sir, demonstrable to people at large. If you go around and ask people around the country, uh, I occasionally do, uh, how many political parties are internally democratic? I won't ask you and embarrass you. So, demonstratable internal democracy will happen when people start feeling there is internal democracy. Unless these three things are done, I think we will continue to fumble along. India has come a long way. I mean, I am not, uh, I am one of those glass half full or half empty. India is, is very much a glass half full. It will get fuller with time, very, very slowly but it can get fuller if we do something radical. Uh, last bit before I close, uh, model of development, what development? I assume the, all the talk that I've heard since yesterday is economic development. Of course, General J.J. Singh mentioned social cohesion and so on and so forth, but I think it is important to remember that uh, the poet Faiz Ahmed Faiz said, Hai aur bhi zamane mein gab mohabbat ke siwa, rahate aur bhi hai rahate vasl ke siwa. There is more to development than economy. And in a different context, Sahir Lidhyanvi said, Zindagi sirf mohabbat hi nahi kuch aur bhi hai. Zulf aur uksar ki jannat hi nahi kuch aur bhi hai. Bhook aur piyas ki maari hui is dunia mein, ish ki ek hakikat nahi kuch aur bhi hai. In this context, ishq is like economic development. There is more to life, ladies and gentlemen, than economic development. And in a country like India, we can't forget that the country, and I do not say our people, I say we. We are also part of the same people. We will not let the country forget that Thank you very much.